This podcast is brought to you by Sales Fuel Hire, a platform to help companies hire smarter and flag 13 toxic employee types. Measure job fit, sales tendencies and motivators, decision making abilities, and empathy levels, and make your next hire your best hire. Try it now on salesfuel.com slash hire and use promo code Manage Smarter for $50 off your first purchase. Welcome to the Manage Smarter Podcast with hosts C. Lee Smith and Audrey Strong. We're glad you're here for discussions on new ways to manage smarter, hire, develop and retain talent, improve results and propel team performance to new heights. This is the Manage Smarter Podcast. Would you like to know what people think of you when they think of you? Are you ready to learn how your visual appearance influences the way people judge you? And do you want to be perceived as successful, hardworking, and intelligent? Who wouldn't? How about in control and commanding? Well, if you answered yes, and yes to all of those, legally you would say yes. yes. Uh, you are in the right place. Hello, everyone. I'm Audrey Strong, the Vice President of Communications for Sales Fuel. Welcome to the Manage Smarter Podcast. I'm C. Lee Smith, the president and CEO of Sales Fuel, and our guest today says that you have seven seconds to establish yourself as a leader. So we're more than seven seconds into the podcast. How are we doing, Sylvie? <laughs> fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's Sylvie DiGisto at our microphones. We are so lucky to have uh, her. And if you don't know who she is, she helps individuals and companies worldwide explore how people make up their minds very quickly. That's an understatement. Uh, about them and either open the door for them or just slam it shut for a sales or a hire or anything like that. Sylvie's got 20 years of corporate experience. She can empower people. Lifelong dream of being an American. You are coming to us from New York City, which is fantastic. And her book is called The Image of Leadership. She's working on a new one. We're going to find out about that. Welcome, Sylvie. Great to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. I'm so thrilled to be with you. So let's talk about this. Uh, where do you want to start? You, let's talk about that seven seconds. How, how did you come to that number? Uh, well, actually, I didn't come to that number. It's a study from the NYU in cooperation with Dr. Professor Michael Solomon. But the reality is the number really doesn't matter as much as you would think. But fact is that our brain makes decisions about others in a millisecond, in a tiny moment, in four seconds, in five seconds, in seven seconds, whatever the number is, and we do it automatically. It has nothing to do with the fact if you are a woman or a man, old or young, experienced or not, if you're in your body or in the body of Mother Teresa, you do it, we all do it, we judge each other, or better said, we stereotype each other, we put each other into boxes that we think are right or wrong with, within milliseconds. What are some of the variables that go into uh, the makeup of, of how that brain works about in you know, the boxes that we're putting? What are the names of those boxes, I guess? Oh, names of the boxes. Well, so the, again, there are different studies out there. I usually use the one that I just mentioned, but again, there are different studies with different or similar results, but we pretty much uh, decide very quickly if somebody is knowledgeable or not, if somebody is reliable or not, if somebody is trustworthy or not. Uh, if somebody is successful or not, if somebody is sophisticated or not. We even think about their religious beliefs, about their political backgrounds, about their sexual orientation. And, you know, it depends on the occasion. So a statement that would be absolutely false and a misinterpretation of that study would be that we say every single time we make 11 decisions in seven seconds, because this is not how it works, but in micro moments, in some of those seconds, depending on the occasion we are in, because there is a difference if I'm in a sales meeting or in a job interview or if I'm dating somebody, our brain unconsciously makes some of those decisions. So what are some of the things that you would, uh, tips that you would have for all of us? I don't know, should we say what you should be doing or what we're all doing wrong? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, there is no one size fits all formula, uh -huh. right? It would be a very old-fashioned thinking that I can tell you now. Here are the top three tips to make a powerful first impressions, right? That doesn't exist. Instead, I want you to think in different layers. First, what do you want to be known for, right? Because confidence is your best designer. If you are confident about who you are and what you represent, your first impression will be impactful and powerful. But then you must find out if this is really the way others perceive you, right? Even if, if, if you have that 
picture in your mind how you would like to be perceived, you must find a way to double check if that is really re reality or if you have to adjust a little bit. And third, and least but uh, important is, you cannot in a professional environment forget that you have clients, that you have clientele, and you must think what do they want to see in you that from the very first moment they decide this is exactly the sales manager or marketing manager or whoever it is I want to work with and do business with. And that depends on the industry you work in and the clientele you serve. That's fascinating. I'm, I, and I'm also wondering you know, about unconscious biases that people have and how does that play into those snap dis, uh, judgments that people make about other people? Mm -hmm. uh, exactly, because one of those biases uh, is, for example, just one confirmation bias, which means our brain wants to be right. We are looking for proof. That's just how our brain is wired. And that's why sometimes we have an initial opinion about somebody and then we ignore everything, everything that goes against that first initial opinion we have because our brain is looking for proof. And unfortunately, on that path, we ignore everything that goes against it. Right? It's that person that meet, I, I meet, for example, at a sales meeting uh, or yesterday evening at the hotel bar and it turns out that something just turned us off. Something was not right. We didn't like that person. The next day we meet the same person in a sales meeting and it turns out to be a super smart woman or guy. But we think, huh, now, now he or she is tricking me. Some, so, something is wrong, right? Because our brain looks for proof. So there are a lot of things happening in our brain and it really has anything to do with the fact if you're a good human being or a bad human being, a good sales expert or a bad one, we all do it, period. So what are some of the things that, or what's the, like, one of the top things, the common thread, if you will, that you encounter with some of the clients that you work with uh, as an area that maybe they're... Uh, they're, they're not in alignment with, with the persona that they, they want to uh, portray out there. You know, I'm, and I'm thinking about it, the way they dress, the way they carry themselves, the gravitas, the way that they, the way that they speak, the way they use certain words, or do, do they joke around? I mean, what, is, you know, what are a couple of things that you see most often with, with people? Well, so first, I have good news and I have bad news for you. The good news is there is a very common model that you can use to evaluate why do people think about me the way they think about me? And I call it the ABCD. They look at your A for your appearance, what you mentioned, right? For example, your clothing. But be aware that looking good and being well-dressed is not enough. It's not mm -hmm. enough. It's just a filter. But your visual appearance, that includes also the suit you are born in, your body. Are you tall? Are you short? Are you healthy or not? Do you take care of it? So the entire visual picture that you create, and then at one point you be for behave, your behavior, your body language, your attitude, your social etiquette, your business etiquette skills. And as you said, your C for your communication, what you say and how you say it. And here is the bad news. Most people focus only on those ABCs in real life when we meet each other and ignore that nowadays, unfortunately, most often, we don't make a first impression anymore in person. We make it in a digital way. Most so D is that digital footprint then. Exactly, your digital footprint. Most often nowadays we send out emails to people whom we haven't met yet, right? And we don't know where those emails go. They could get forwarded and forwarded and forwarded and create an imprint somewhere where we even don't know. Right now somebody could Google your name, your name right now and make the decision if he or she is going to call you or not do business with you or not, hire you or not, right? So your digital footprint, unfortunately, has become the biggest part of uh, the way people perceive you, of your perception, because it is out there. And you cannot stop anymore that it is out there, but what you can do is you can influence what is out there. Mm -hmm. I also think that A, B, and C also go into the D. So it's like, for example, I see a lot of people that, you know, don't have a professional high quality headshot on their social media profile, or I see people that when they behave online or whatever, they, 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 they want to play gotcha or they want to get all political or they want to, you know, you know, they're, they're not super nice because they're, they're hiding behind a screen. Trolls. Yeah, screening. Yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. and also the way that they communicate, do they, do they use emoji and memes or, you know, or they, you know, 
uh, are they part of the grammar police out there? So I'm, I'm wondering, do you think that the A, B, and C actually, you know, filters into the D, or is the D something totally different? No, absolutely. It, it absolutely filters in, and you also have to realize that it must be consistent with your real life. You cannot pretend to be somebody online that you are not offline, right? So that mm -hmm. must be a match, because otherwise you also don't create a digital footprint on purpose that will help you, because at one point people are going to figure out. It's the same, I can have... The, the fanciest headshot on LinkedIn as a profile picture, if it is uh, 10 years old or if I don't look that way anymore, it also doesn't help me if it's a great picture, right? So you, you must make sure that your digital footprint is consistent with the way you represent yourself in real life. So be authentic. You know, we've got this new, you guys have heard this new phrase, the cancel culture digitally mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. and you said you know your digital footprint can affect your life your career your profession people have gotten canned over a yeah. simple post on that they had on a public facing facebook page or one tweet and you're you're out of your job or you've lost your biggest client can you talk a little bit about that absolutely i'm um i'm currently as you mentioned working on, on my next book will which will focus exclusively on the digital footprint that you leave behind. And I split it in two areas. One is the conscious one, the things that we immediately think about, which nowadays actually should be, let's say, social media one-on-one, -on -one, things that I don't post, things that I don't communicate, that one tweet that somebody sent and didn't think that this will have a huge impact on his or her career, on the organization, the work for or the business that they own, right? But there is also, don't forget, an unconscious footprint that uh, we leave behind. The, the time that you spent online, for example, and we have all done that, right? We, we all looked over to that other profile of our colleague that posted 27 times per day, and we were thinking, wow, doesn't he have anything to do at work? And what does it <laughs> say about the company he works for or she, right? So there are a lot of in-between-the-lines messages that we send out. And yes, short notice, one of those very harmful posts or tweets that you mentioned, that can immediately make somebody lose his or her job over it. But on the long term, also the unconscious one, when you, in between the lines, again and again and again, send specific messages. You know, I've also um, heard that some people are, like you said, reading between the lines. So let's say you control yourself and you're not a troll and you're not posting inflammatory posts and tweeting like a crazy person. But I, if I'm considering hiring you as my client or, you know, I'm out in the marketplace or I want to hire you, I can go on your Twitter and look at who you're following and tell your political leanings potentially. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, what do you do? You would just keep a business account that's public and a, uh, your Twitter is private that's protected tweets. What are some of the tips? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the first step is that you have to be aware that all that information is out there. And there is much more out there than you actually know about you, right? But the very easy things to find, who does that person follow? Who follows that person? What does, does that person endorse? What does that person like and share? Those are all visual actions that we can see, right? And so every time you do something like that, you must be aware people are watching you, period. And I mean, I'm a very good example myself. I have political opinions, very strong ones, but I also, I'm in the business of first impressions. I'm in the business of reputations. I just cannot comment on something online. I cannot because it would be harmful for my business if anybody finds out that I lean either to the one or to the other side, right? So the same mm -hmm. might be for you. While um, on the other side, I protect myself very much on Facebook, for example. You are only my Facebook friend if you or I have met each other at least once in my life because I only mm -hmm. want to give those people insight. So I, I protect myself a little bit from others using information consciously or unconsciously um, to my disadvantage. There are some business consultants that I've heard speak from the stage that, that, that like to say, it doesn't matter, you know, you, you can't really separate business from personal because people are going to find it out anyway. So just go ahead and throw it all out there or whatever, be authentic, be who you are or whatever, and let people see who you really are. Mm -hmm. What would you say to those people? Well, you know, be authentic is such a good uh, example. It's such an overused word, right? Mm -hmm. 
some just use it the wrong way because be authentic doesn't mean that you don't have to care anymore. Right? It doesn't mean I don't care, I just share everything about everything with everybody. Be authentic means that you are not fake. Right, but that doesn't mean that you wouldn't be allowed to hold specific information back because that's also that's part of my authentic me. That I decided my authentic me, I don't want to share everything about myself with the entire world. Period. What characteristics or keywords would you use to describe a leader, and and what kind of image should we be striving for? Mm. I think that first and foremost, successful leaders appear and behave and communicate like successful ones long before they actually are one, right? They, they, they start with the path of leadership and give others the opportunity to see them, mentor them, promote them long before they are in that leadership position they are going to end up. So if you want to become the CEO of your company in 10 years, be, appear, behave, and communicate online and offline like a CEO already today. And the other thing is, I think that successful leaders appear, behave, communicate, confident. Confidence is such a powerful tool you need for your leadership because if you are not confident about yourself, how could we be confident about you? Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that successful leaders care first and foremost about themselves. Now, that might sound weird to some and say that is very selfish, right? But there is a very simple concept in behind that only if you take care of yourself first, people think you have the ability to take care of others too. Mm -hmm. And then also not, also not forget integrity. Yes. And my last one is successful leaders, they appear, behave, and communicate respectful. And uh, respectful towards themselves because they know they are the most important element within their career. It's not their boss. It's not the CEO. It's not human resources. It's not a, a different department. It's them. They are responsible for their career and for their success. And therefore, they show a lot of respect to themselves and are willing to invest into themselves. But then obviously also to others, to their teams, to um, um, those they work with, to other religions, to other genders, to other generations. They show respect. Well, we have a few minutes left, Sylvie. It's sylviedegusto.com, and that's your Twitter name as well. You want to talk a little bit about the book, The Image of Leadership, and your e-learning course as well? Uh, well, The Image of Leadership is a book I have written after 20 years in uh, human resources in corporations around the world, where I describe what impact the way you or the, the first impression you make on others, what impact it has on how people inside your organization and outside uh, perceive you as a leader or not. And it describes the concepts we just discussed, the A, B, C, Ds, and how successful leaders appear, behave, and communicate respectful and confident, etc. And on that path and throughout the past years, I just explored how important Day by day, your digital footprint um, becomes, and therefore I'm now writing the second book, the follow-up book again, with a focus on people who are professionals, work either for their own business or for in, in within corporations, what impact that digital footprint has on the way people perceive you in real life. And there are big parts you might not think about right now the unconscious footprint that you leave behind that have a bigger impact that you are probably aware right now. And all of this comes together in an online course called How You Impress, um, where you can have the content of the book and much more, more practical exercises where you can actually work on your digital footprint than online in a course. That sounds great. I had one last question for you, uh, Sylvie. It's like, which is most important in that first seven seconds, the A, B, C, or D? Um, the D, because it happens all the time. Right now, you cannot control anymore that it happens. If you would ask me what is the easiest to change, though, then I would say the A, because the A is just a filter in front of you, right? We all know if we want to change our behavior or the words that we say, our communication, that is really hard, hard mm -hmm. work. The A is so easy. It's just a filter. If you want to get started anywhere, then start either with your D, because 
it's out there right now. What with your A because it's so easy to change. So I am, the minute we're done with this, I'm going to go look at my digital footprint and then go shopping. <laughs> with you for the second one. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. It was such a pleasure. What a great topic. And I, uh, the tips and the advice are fantastic. Thanks, Sylvie. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend on iTunes, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more great information at salesfuel.com.